each speaker uh, after we have an opening prayer and some drumming to center us and to gather us onto this land. Each speaker will have 10 minutes. And there's a timekeeper who's uh, going to raise, you got two minutes, you got one minute, or you got the hook, it's over. Uh, and all speakers have, a, have agreed that at that moment, I will stand up and just come and gently be beside them to kind of nudge them away from the microphone. Uh, but they each have 10 minutes to give their talk. And this is a sign of respect for the peak speakers who will follow and for you who will have a time after that for uh, some questions and answers from, from each of the speakers. So we'll have uh, Q&A uh, after they speak. And then there's a couple of other people who will uh, wind up the uh, afternoon for us. There's also a petition uh, outside where you came in uh, for people to sign, so we invite you to do that on the way out. If anything else uh, emerges or something, we'll just roll, go with the flow and roll with, with the evening. So thank you all for being here. I'll ask Gus Many Bears now, Blackfoot Elder, uh, from the community in uh, Blackfoot Elder from the Blackfoot Confederacy. He is a community worker actually with Calgary's Aboriginal Friendship Center here in Calgary, uh, working with elders. So, so I understand that our drummers are from Morley and I'd ask Autumn to introduce Cody and Christopher and whomever else is a part of the drumming circle. Um, good afternoon. Uh, just a brief introduction of our drummers. Um, we have Cody Black Kettle, who's from Sixaga, uh, Jesse Pelche, also from Sixaga, and Christopher Pegram. He's actually from New York. He's, I can't remember now, Kitua. He lives in Morley with his, uh, his wife and his two sons, and his uh, son Noah will be drumming as well. Um, these guys have actually been a part of the flash mobs since the beginning that we had here in Calgary starting last December. And so they've uh, kind of kept the tradition going and they've been coming out to all of the flash mobs since. So please give a warm welcome for them.
We are very uh, honored this afternoon to have Chief Alan Adam with us, and I'll ask Gitz if you will please introduce him to our audience. Many of us have seen him on various programs on television and on social media, and we're very honored to have him with us this afternoon as we begin our conversations. I'd like to introduce my, uh, my Dene chief to the traditional Blackfoot territory. I'm both Dene, Suthne, and Pikani. And it's with great honor that I can introduce this chief, this man here who's speaking out against uh, oil sands, tar sands development, and asking for it to be somewhat accountable, somewhat environmentally friendly and respectful of the treaties. So this is, this is my chief, Alan Adam, everybody. Well, thank you all for coming out and you know, supporting ACFN uh, in regards to what we're trying to accomplish is that to educate the general public about what is treaty, you know, because you hear and know what's been going on right across this country in a little over a year now. Um, you know, I don't know more in more ways than one when you look at this whole thing and stuff, you know, and when you look at the banners and everything, it was because the First Nations people were tired of the fact that treaties were not being honored and the, and the people feel the fact about nothing was getting done in more ways than one and laws were being trampled on and stuff like that, so. But, you know, uh, we, we've taken over from Chief and Council six years, we've been in office and you know, our staff, uh, we were never idling. You know, we, we were fighting right from day one when we took over and, you know, we said to each other that we we're gonna dig our heels in and we're going you know, this is where we, we make a stand. And now we're in the trenches and we're, you know, we're fighting, we're fighting for our livelihood. I know when you, when you look at the fact that, you know, Canada does not represent uh, the interests of uh, citizens of Canada because human rights, human rights are being trampled down here in Canada, not only against uh, First Nations people, but against your citizenship. You know, and it's, it's hard that uh, to get a grip on everything and, you know, and we know what we stand for, for First Nations people. We know what treaty is all about. I live, breathe, and eat every day and think about nothing but treaty. Because it, if it wasn't for treaty, we wouldn't be living together. It was a sharing agreement based on what the oral history of our elders keep telling us. The sharing agreement about the land and the ownership about who is what and where is going to, that we will be able to live in harmony with each other. The deals made that when we were supposed to go and take whatever and you know hunt fish and trap and live off the land like we were like the Europeans never came here before like you would be able to live in freedom. But that's not what the government wanted because right from year one we've been in we've been fighting with the government ever since we signed the treaty because they came back and they said that this is what the treaty really means. And pretty much the treaty it right across the country when they're signed and signatured. And if you look at it really closely, you know, there's a little X that they put there on all the chiefs. And uh, it's striking uh, resemblance is that it's one guy that did that because pretty much every X is the same writing. So it's ironic that, you know, some areas and when you look at the treaty and stuff like that, you see that X, and I don't think that, you know, back then and when Treaty 8 was signed, uh, you know, uh, 40, or I forget how much it was back then, 20 something, I think, whatever, 39 or 48, I don't know, whatever the number was back then. But then as, a, as we went on, groups split apart and some, so some areas became like about three different treaties or three different First Nations out of that, like, you know, so that's how it goes. But the fact remains, you know, it's, um, it's a tough battle. It's a tough battle for a First Nation leader to uh, take this endeavor. And this is where our land and everything comes into, into play because we are fighting for our livelihood right now. We are fighting for 
the generations of people, you know, for to come. One one day, you know, you have a chance and say, you know, you look back in history, and if we do make the correct changes here, you know, we could live and be a better Canada, a better Canada, is what how we would like to say. But it's grueling. It's tough. It's hard work. You know, we we work it out the way we want to work it out. You know, Ariel's been instrumental in regards to you know her activism and her stuff that she does. You know, she was an activist before she even came work for me, and I had to hire her to calm her down. <laughs> Gets on the other side of it. There's you know, it's a cousin of ours, and um, you know, he's still ranting on, but I never hired him yet, so. But the fact remains, you know, we got a problem, and we're only going to fix it if we ever have that discussion. And the problem it has is that the Canadians are not educated on treaty, and you have to educate yourself. You have to educate your kids what treaty was all about and what the intent was for treaty. The only way you get an understanding, and it's very simple. Social media, you got, you know, those you're looking at the web there. You could just go on Google and say. Uh, treaty and it'll tell you all about the treaties inside there. It's right on the Google, you know, so go all over the place. You go right from one to eleven. Okay, you guys gotta go now. So there's your treaty one oh one. Yeah. You know, it's an honor, like, you know, we have former Chief Walter Janvey from Coal Lake First Nation here, who is a council member now. We also have a close colleague of mine of there, uh, Chief Vern Janvey from the Athabasca Tribal Council, who is the president of the Tribal Council and everything. Um, Shannon, who is a council member from uh, Lesser, no, Saddle Lake First Nation. I don't know if there's any other leaders in here from the First Nations. So, but like that, you know, we all, we all have our issues. We all have this common goal is we've got a common issue. And our issue is your issue. The only thing is that you don't force your government to start recognizing and tell them that, you know, to work hand in hand with the First Nations and deal with this whole mess that we're in right now. We're only trying to save our way of life. But it also has a lot of effects for future generations to come. And those future generations could be your grandchildren. People move around no matter where they go. You cannot stop them. You know, and when you when you go further up north, uh, the land is beautiful. You know, it's intact. But the water issue is the one that's uh, um, affecting our people more ways than one, and that's why we took that stand. You know, we have people dying of cancer, people being diagnosed with cancer. All you know, it's it's just out of whack. And gutting the regulatory system for environmental laws just doesn't cut it anymore. We should have stronger regulations, you know, and um, industry would have to obey by them. Why is it that Norway or you know, the Norwegians or other European countries put a tax on the industry when they come in, they're 74% tax? Why is it in Canada that it's in, in Alberta? Why is it only 14% tax? You know, why is it that in, in Alberta, one of the richest provinces they brag about right across Canada? On a daily basis, we're going into deficit, $11 million every day. You know, why is that? You know, if you don't understand those things, whatever, shouldn't be happening. But that's what's happening here. Because corporations are getting, you know, big tax breaks and everything and stuff like that. Seventy-two percent of all their resource uh, revenue that's uh, cut, taken out of here is leaving the country by foreign investors, multinationals. They're not even getting it here. Seventy-four percent of it is gone as we go every day. That's from Ariel. Okay, and uh, so. My executive says, uh, shut up now and get out of stage. And so that's how we communicate together, her and I, because we got used to working with each other for so long. And uh, So educate yourself about treaty. 
put pressure on your government in regards to what's going on because uh, we are a nation of 1,098 people and we're fighting for the better of this country. We're fighting for you as a citizen for this country and we're fighting for the First Nations people across this country because what we're doing is gonna take precedence right across this whole country if we succeed. But if we fail, we fail dearly. Thank you. So I'm just wanting to, to sort of give you guys an understanding of what ACFN is doing. So I've been given one minute to do an overview of our litigation. Ready? I'm going to be really funny. Okay. So, um, well, you guys were given some handouts, but basically what ACFN is doing is we have drawn the line in the sand. There's a really great website. I'm saying it's really great because I built it, called drawtheline.ca, and you can find some more information on it. But basically, the Jack Pine Mine expansion project was approved by the federal government in December of, of 2013. That project is in clear violation of many environmental rights along with our, our treaty rights. And so we've launched an appeal of that decision. A majority of the, the money that we're getting through the Neil Young concerts and this very fundraiser that you guys are doing for us will go to the litigation costs for that. But in addition to that, it's not just one case for us. We have a legal strategy. That's them trying to tell me to hurry up. So uh, in addition, it's just it's a legal strategy. We're not trying to put all our eggs in one basket like the Alberta government and the economy of this country. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to look at different ways to address the issue. So we're challenging within the regulatory hearing process. So we're challenging two new upcoming projects called the, the Pierre River Mine Project proposed by Shell and the Frontier Mine Project proposed by Shell Resources. Those projects are up for approval and they're in an area that we have literally drawn a line in the sand for. So our nation has said our traditional territory north of the Firebag River and along the southern boundaries of our Poplar Point homelands is non-negotiable. We do not want to see development there because it's essential to us being able to continue practicing our treaty and Aboriginal rights, not just now but into the future. It's critical habitat for species at risk, migratory birds, large game, woodland caribou, wood bison, um, and it's essential to the maintaining the ecosystems that are vital, not just for us, but for all Canadians. We are at the, at the front, front, front lines of holding the line to the destruction of the last remaining and the largest remaining intact forest in the world, Canada's Boreal Forest. We're in trouble as a species, and so for us, we're doing what we can with what our rights are allowing us to do. And I really hope that all Canadian citizens start looking into what your rights are, because we can no longer sit back and be complacent and allow our rights to be railroaded in the pursuit for economic gain by few. So I thank you for staying in solidarity with the ACFN. <laughs> this is from the chief, hurry up. I was wrapping it up, see that? Yeah. So I, I thank you all for coming and standing in solidarity with us. And I thank all these great warrior women and men uh, <laughs> for, for filling our shoes as we've been really busy with this tour and, and apologize for not being able to be, stay here, but we've got to run and help some the drummers that are helping at the concert tonight set up. So again, thank you so much. From the bottom of our hearts, Mussy Cho, and we hope to see you in the struggle as we move forward in 2014. Thank you. That was pretty good. I didn't have to say a word about getting people uh, to wrap it up. I got two big signs wrap it up here now. We move along with uh, our first uh, speaker of, on the panel here. Crazy Boy Gitz Derange is a member of the ACFN and is a youth worker now living in Calgary. He grew up in Fort McMurray in the Wood Buffalo area and uh, growing up there and being part of that community, he witnessed firsthand the expansion and costs of the tar sands development. He is a popular educator and speaker on First Nations topic, and he will lead us off in honoring the treaties. Crazy boy. It's actually Gitz 
Crazy boy. Well, gets crazy. Crazy boy. Okay. It's black for name comes from down in Brocken. Uki niksukwa ntaniko baksikoi nistu dene pikani. My name is Gitz. I'm 29 years old. I'm a youth worker up in Fort McMurray. I actually was a former youth worker in Fort McMurray. I just relocated down here. Um, we moved up in 89. Um, my mom's side's Blackfoot, and she comes from Brockett. On my dad's side's Dennis Suthan, and they're from Lake Athabasca all the way up to Uranium City. Um, years ago, my dad met my mom and thought she was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. And uh, he asked her to go out with him. And she just said, no, flat out, no. And then she yeah, kept uh, approaching her and approaching her and approaching her. And every time she shot him down over and over and over again. But he couldn't let this woman go. And eventually he swept her off her feet and uh, moved her from Brockett, Alberta, which is just two hours south of here, all the way up to, to Fort Chip. And actually they lived on the, the trap lines in Uranium City for about three or four years, just completely off the grid. Um, I was born in 84 here in Calgary. And then in 89, we moved up to Fort Mac. And then I grew up there, graduated there, and I started traveling around. I'd travel around for a couple of years and I'd come back to McMurray, travel around a little bit and come back. And so I really got to see the expansion of the tar sands as I was growing up. And it's nothing like I've, nothing I could ever really imagine. It's this, been in this incredible. Um, Thank you for giving us that show library. We'll be closing in five minutes. Please take your materials and check out stations on the main floor. Okay, so I got five minutes. Um, so growing up there, you get to see this expansion and you get to see workers coming in. And there, in the beginning, in the late, late 80s, early 90s, there was a bit of racism. But I mean, I think the whole country at that time was pretty racist. But there was a lot of intolerant attitudes at the time. And then around the mid-90s, John Chen came up and said that this was going to be the next hub. And they started pouring all this money into McMurray. And after that, this population expansion just blew up everywhere. And we started having people from all over the world coming up. Workers. I started noticing that there's a lot of foreign workers coming up. Um, companies started expanding because the royalties are so low. And because all the royalties are so low, it's really, really hard to find an apartment there. It's really, really hard to find a place um, to live. Uh, I was, I think I was on a five-year waiting list for a one-bedroom apartment up in McMurray. And that's just because, you know, people can jack up the rent as high as they want. We're looking at, like, not like $1,000 a month. We're looking at $1,800 a month and higher. Um, the province spends about 7000 to 8000 for food yearly. In McMurray, you spend between, I think it was twelve to 14000 for food. Um, that's just the cost of living. It's, it's insane to live up there. Everybody that has a house usually has a roommate. Um, but then, of course, with all this money became the, the gangs and the drugs, and watching that affect all the, the kids up there and my own relatives. And when I graduated, I thought I was going to stay to McMurray, but and I kind of wanted to see like just the world. And I went out and I started traveling. I started traveling on South America. I was working with kids down there. And I had a knack. I was raising, helping to raise my nephews and nieces. And went back home, I started working with kids. And that's always the, uh, this is the reason why I do this. We have right now the, the fear. It's, it's, like, it's a bit of a fear. We don't live in it, we live of it. It's, it's on the horizon that the climate is changing, that we are polluting our rivers, that there are species on the brink of dis uh, destruction. I mean, species are dying all over the world, but up north, we're talking about the carib caribou populations, we're talking about the, the moose, uh, we're talking about bird species. And whether or not they're on their way out, we're living during that period. My big fear, and it, it, it bothers me, and it, it uh, consumes me sometimes, of living in that world where you're living in that fear, where the, the waters are completely polluted, the plants are completely polluted, you have nowhere to go, and you're looking for answers. And there's nothing in front of you but toxicity. You could already see it from the photos that you take off from up there. And we're living... We're, right now, it's about maybe less than 10% or maybe less than 5% of full development. We're having all these environmental issues, and they're trying to push forward faster with all of this. As Indigenous peoples, our cultural perspective is living a living relationship with the land, like a living relationship. Not something you can read in a history book, but to actually be on the land, to feel the energy, to feel, uh, in Blackfoot we say tzachkum, to feel the earth, to really be out there and humble yourself, to know what the elements are like, to, to know what it is to be cold, you know, to be like minus 50 um, cutting up a moose and knowing you got to like haul that stuff back um, through the snow back to my aunties who are going to be chopping up that and bringing, you know, telling us where to, to, put the, to, meet, to put the meat. That is our living relationship. If you don't have that ability to go out into the land, you don't have the ability to go to your identity. 
Uh, people come from all over the world, you know, to live here in Canada. And they come to this, they call it a mosaic, but we're kind of turning into a melting pot. Um, and you know this if you have uh, friends from different parts of the planet. They say they're kind of losing that little thing that they have inside them, whether it's their language, their songs, their ceremonies, their stories. They can all go home, and they should, if they want to reclaim that. Then when they get that, they can come back here, and they can have that identity in it, within them. And you can see how strong it makes them. They have holy places to go. They have holy books. For us, our holy places and our holy books is being on the land. That's where we get our direction from. That's our moral compass. That's something that separates us from, you know, being bloodthirsty savages, is our ability to go and pray and be humble and be with the land and know what it is to provide. The thing that, a while back, they talked about the treaties. It was to preserve the environment. And because when you preserve the environment, you preserve our identity. The two go hand in hand. You can't just have this insane amount of development that's polluting everything and our land. There has to be this interchange between the both of them. Some places around Canada, you can't do that. And some places, it's harder to do that. But some places, you can go, you know, throw a line out, drop a net, go pick berries, go find medicines. And so it's wicked when an elder brings you out and you can find those things and do that with them. And they instruct you with the voice that has been guided from the ancestors. That's my five minutes. And it's, it's awesome to be instructed by these, these ancestral voices. That you know that somebody, one of your ancestors who's lived and died, and was doing the exact same practices as you. And you're carrying that on for the next generation. There's some unique, beautiful gift that's within that. To know that you have that, you're taking that, that, that information. Because when you come to the cities, it's a lot harder to see that, that the culture is still staying alive. There's two types of developments that happen in Port McMurray, or up north, I should say. The first is uh, surface mining, which is where they strip everything away. They're destroying all species uh, on the earth. They call it overburden. But really, they've got to dig down to get to the tar sands. And tar sands is like the oil and the sand are one. It looks like clay. But everything above that, the topsoil, the abundant amount of species of plants, animals, insects that live and thrive there, you have to kill all of them. You have to destroy all that earth. You have to, to get the tar sands. There's no other two ways around it. And through, when you actually get the tar sands, you begin to boil it out. I'm really simplifying it. This is, it could spend like a whole week telling you the extraction process. But you take all this tar sands and you start boiling it up. And when you boil it up, you get a thick, viscous um, oil still. It's not something that can be used right away. And from that comes the waste. And this is uh, stuff that they burn off waste that, get, that gets into the air. This is the tailings ponds, which you can see from space. Toxic substances that they, they have to monitor for the next 150 to 160 years after production has stopped. Not before, but after it has stopped. This is the investment we give to the future. This is the investment. And these things are leaking into under, underground aquifers and waterways. And we see it. They talk about uh, windmills killing birds. Our tailings pond kills birds. But you never hear of these windmills killing animals like such as foxes or beaver or elk or caribou. And you can go on and research all the animals that get euthanized because they drink from that water or they're in that water. All of them have to die. That's how toxic they are. And they're growing bigger every single day. These are just a couple of the things from just a surface mine alone. In situ is when they stick a big pipe into the ground and they start using mass amount of heat energy to begin the extraction process in the earth. And another pipe to suck it all back up. The problem with this is that the limestone that the earth is over, geothermal energy, not really that hot. So it's like if you're really, really hot and you go lie down in the cement, your heat energy gets sucked at you like that. Up there, they have to keep using this heat energy over and over and over again to cook up the earth. And once they get to that point, they can begin the extraction process. The waste is still there. It still produces waste. You just can't see it. <clears throat> now, I've been calling this a couple of times by my girlfriend over there when I'm cleaning up, not to like sweep anything under the rug. <laughs> Essentially, this is, is we have a rug of earth, but underneath all of that is the most insanely toxic substances. And because we can't see it, the, they, they want us to believe that the problems are not there. And they are. Now, there's a divide that's happening. I'll stop, right, I'll stop right after this. There's a divide that's happening I see within the Conservative Party. You are the conservative for Harper and his agenda. 
and it has nothing to do with the environment at all. It's all about making money at the expense of the environment, at the expense of lives. It's disregarding everything. If you look at the omnibus bills and everything that they gave up, there is nothing with this prime minister that is sustainable, that is long term. You can be conservative with Harper, or you can be conservative for Canada. Two very, very different parallel opposites. And it's time we actually start waking up to this. They can point all the fingers they want to Neil Young and say he's a hypocrite because he uses oil. We all use oil. All of us use oil from one uh, degree to another. And we can point all the fingers we want at this person, whoever tries to speak out, but the end result is the pollution is still there, our people are still dying, and our environment, our earth, is paying the forfeit of this. Now, that's all I want to say for right now. That's so why I thank you for my time. Thank you very much. Uh, Crystal Lehman is our next uh, speaker. She's a member of the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, the Tar Sands Program Coordinator for the Sierra Club Canada and Sierra Club Prairie Chapter, Climate and Energy Campaigner. That's a long title, eh? <laughs> Beaver Lake, uh, along with many other communities, are within the territory affected by four bitumen spills by CNRL that have been going on for eight months. Crystal's work is based on raising the platform of Indigenous peoples and how the inherent treaty rights of Canadian First Nations is one of the strongholds in saving our environment and ecosystems from extreme resource extraction. And Crystal goes all over the place, educating people, mobilizing people, and calling us to action. Crystal. Do you want these? Because you're probably going to need them for me. <laughs> we have a history, him and I. Thanks <laughs> uh, and hello. Um, I don't need to say anything about myself because he said enough. I want to um, first of all acknowledge the Treaty 7 territory and um, that of the Blackfoot Confederacy that we're standing on today. Um, <clears throat> I want to start out by saying that um, you know, when we talk about what are treaty rights, um, you know, a lot of us immediately go to uh, Canadian law. We immediately go to that piece of paper that was the agreement between the British Crown and the First Peoples of, of Turtle Island. But for us, you know, the way I was brought up, you know, luckily, um, you know, the knowledge that I was raised with is that treaty for us, first and foremost, as First Nations people, um, was an agreement with Xemanto, uh, our, our creator. Uh, you know, the, the, that's why there was the importance of that pipe and, and that agreement happened with the pipe. Because those promises and, and that agreement, that, that agreement that we would live in friendship, was put into that smoke and carried to the creator and that cannot be broken. And that was, that, I think that's been the hugest, or, or the, rather the largest um, misconception, you know, when we talk about what is treaty. And, and um, you know, when First Nations people talk about treaty cannot be broken. That's what we mean. But then, of course, you know, we go to the Canadian Constitution. So I just want to let you all know that normally I'll just talk. Um, but because I'm on a very tight time constraint, <laughs> I, 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 I scripted everything just so that um, I would ensure that the message was given um, because I was asked to touch on a lot of different things that normally do not take 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and, and, uh, and read that. So 80% of traditional territory of the Miccosukri and Athabasca Chippewan First Nations that um, has been rendered inaccessible for most of the year due to tar sands development. The Beaver Lake Cree's traditional hunting territory, which is the traditional hunting territory of Treaty 6, spans 38,972 square kilometers of natural habitat. With 34,773 square kilometers of that being oil and gas wells. 
So one well site equals one hectare of habitat loss. 30% increase in cancer rates of the residents of Fort Chip. It's been 115 years since Treaty 8, which protects First Nations rights to consultation, was signed. It's been 138 years since Treaty 6, which protects First Nations rights to consultation, was signed. And by 2020, greenhouse gas emissions will grow to 104 million tons <clears throat> with business as usual. And most climate scientists state that it needs to stay in the ground before the climate reaches its tipping point. And tar sands is the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. Millions of liters spilled into the Athabasca River from the October 31st, 2013 incident when a containment pond was breached at the Obed Mountain coal mine, 674. Number of countries that Canada's tar sands emissions exceed, 85. Times greater of emissions from producing a barrel of oil from the oil sands versus a barrel of conventional oil, so crude oil, 3.5. Rank of the oil sand for fastest greenhouse gas emissions growth in Canada, one. After 46 years of development, 15% of the boreal forest has been returned to its natural state. So when the government and industry tries to sell you reclamation, they're full of shit. <laughs> Expected number of dead birds from oil sands development over the next 20 years, 30 million. So that's where I say they're full of shit again too when they talk about wind turbines and birds. Within the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, the caribou population has declined 70% since 1996. Wildlife is being drastically affected. <clears throat> in 2011, 175 to 275 caribou remain within the Beaver Lake Cree Nation traditional hunting territory. This is an animal that we need to understand that used to be in the thousands. It's an animal that my Muslims used to um, follow they knew the migration patterns of the caribou, and they used to be in the thousands. And there's stories about the migration patterns of the caribou and the amount of caribou that we had that we used to sustain ourselves off of. And we are now currently at around 200 caribou left in our traditional hunting territory. By 2025, there's an estimated 50, 2040, an estimated 10. In the future, they're gonna reach extinction. The Beaver Lake Cree have recorded more than 20,000 treaty rights violations on their traditional territory due to tar sands development. With runaway climate change and emissions from the tar sands set to quadruple, treaty rights are the last stand we have in saving what we have left and leaving a legacy for our children. That doesn't include displacement, destructed lands, and poisoned waters. Alberta, home to the tar sands, has disturbed the natural landscape more than any other province in Canada. A new study shows that when mixed with sediment, bitumen sinks in salt water, making a tanker spill almost impossible to clean up. Over 130 First Nations have signed the Save the Fraser Declaration opposing tar sands development on their traditional territories. And then we look at, you know, that, that's the basis of, de of development. Then we look at what our awesome Canadian government has done for us. Conservative government passed Bill C-38, which, which gutted our environmental laws. Bill C-45, which was, you know, when the Idle No More movement broke out, was a First Nations land grab and the complete ignorance that 80% of the world's fresh water is in Canada. And we need to bear in mind that there's only 1% of fresh water in the world. Who gave this government the right to destroy our fresh water system and with barely a nod to the question of what are we going to drink when disaster strikes? because it will. And when it does, it's not going to know race, color, or creed. When an industry is using 1.7 billion barrels of our fresh water every day, there's going to come an end. Now let's back up to December 2012 when we had two and a half million protected lakes and rivers and one day after passing the Bill C-45, we were left with 97 protected lakes and 62 protected rivers, which was then followed by the Alberta Provincial Bill S-8, which was the privatization of our water taking the milk of our mother and turning it into a commodity. A government's attempt at trying to sell what was never theirs in the first place. And who can afford this? The poor First Nations people living in third world living conditions in a first world country? 
The poor farmer who relies on his crops to feed his family? No, the 99%. That's who can afford it. And this government made sure of that. Then this government pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. It signed FIPA, yet more behind the scenes closed door decisions, deliberately ignoring the de democratic process of involving the citizen members of this nation we call Canada. So here we sit, a government refusing to accept responsibility and hiding from accountability and transparency. So that's a clear indication that this is no longer an Indian problem. If you breathe air and you drink water, this is about you. <clears throat> so what do we have left? Holy smokes. Yeah. <laughs> what do we have left other than treaty rights? Alberta enforces less than 1% of tar sands environmental violations. And after eight months and over 1.8 million liters of spilled bitumen emulsion, four CNRL tar sands spills are still continuing on the Cold Lake Air Weapons Range in an extraction process that is supposed to be the environmentally friendly form of tar sands development, SAGD. Shell thinks by investing $1.5 million into Aboriginal issues that we should just tip our hats and say, thank you, move along. No, because like it's been stated as treaty people, we are not stakeholders, we are rights holders, and there's a big damn difference. ACFN's application states that the approval process for the Jack Pine expansion has broke federal statute within the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, the Species at Risk Act, and the Migratory Birds Convention Act, as well as several international agreements Canada has signed. And like the Beaver Lake Cree, it has broken the federal government's obligation to consult the peoples of that territory. I'm just gonna tell you right now, I'm probably gonna go like two minutes over, maybe three. <laughs> um, this is really important. <laughs> um, and so therefore, um, the Prime Minister's office has admitted that the breach of the fiduciary responsibility, the, or rather so, the environmental impacts affects the First Nation and Aboriginal rights to land use, which then is a breach of the fiduciary responsibility to uphold Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. So that's First Nations rights enshrined as Aboriginal rights in Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982, are arguably some of the most important emerging rights on the Canadian legal landscape and certainly the most powerful environmental rights in this country. Thus, when these mega projects are destroying the First Nations rights to hunt, trap and fish, which are in direct violation of our constitutional rights, the highest law in Canada, then there is grounds to challenge. These constitutional rights are the strongest environmental laws in Canada and possibly the world. And now that the Canadian federal, federal government has gutted Canada's environmental legislation, this is critical. And the fight of the Beaver Lake Cree and Fort Chip in protecting their hunting grounds and fishing waters is supported by those who see the massive destruction of the landscape as an environmental crime. And those who fear that the carbon released by the heavy oil projects may take the planet's climate past the tipping point. And this is winnable, because the law is clearly on the side of the First Nations of Canada. The only barrier to justice and victory in this case is the high cost of the legal system. Canada and Alberta do not want to lose this case, neither does industry, and they're putting up a serious fight. So now I'm going to, um, I touched a little bit on for uh, ACFN, and I'm going to touch a little bit on my nation's litigation. So it was initiated by former retired Chief Al Amon and now carried forth by the current leadership. Beaver Lake Cree Nation is doing something few would dare to try, but many believe needs doing. They are suing the federal and Alberta governments for the health of the planet to preserve the integrity of the boreal forest and the habitat that has sustained their people for generations, and to ensure the future happiness and freedom of their children and all our children in a world that has been taken over by greenhouse gas emissions. They have drawn a line in the tar sand against the rapid, unmitigated expansion of the Alberta oil sands industries. And within territories like the Beaver Lake Cree, where 30% of the tar sands production, or 560,000 barrels per day, with plans to grow to 1.6 million barrels per day and new permits being granted on a daily basis. So here we are. Now, when we talk about treaty rights and how those protect, where there is a treaty or Aboriginal right, governments cannot destroy the meaningful opportunity to access, ex exercise the right. For a right to hunt, fish, or gather plant or medicine resources to be meaningful, there must remain a harvestable surplus of the species being collected. To have a har harvestable surplus, there must be a healthy, productive wild population. To have a healthy wild population, there must be sufficient productive habitat to support that population. 
In other words, there must be a healthy natural environment. If the natural environment is degraded by industrial activity and the populations are stressed and put into crisis by industry, and if there's no longer a population of species healthy enough to support the right, then there has been an infringement of the right. And that's where we have the nation's poorest people carrying litigations on their backs to protect our basic human rights, not just as First Nations people, but as human beings. And everybody in this room has an obligation to leave here and tell 10 people about that. And by you all being here, um, you are supporting that fight. So thank you. Um, and if you want to learn more about ACFN and Beaver Lake's trials, you can go to uh, thetarsanstrial.ca for the Beaver Lake Crees litigation crowdfund. And you can go to honortheacfn.ca for their uh, crowdfund. Um, I, I, thank you. We will have some time uh, for questions after uh, the speakers are finished their time. So, but we invite you to uh, write out your question on a piece of paper, which I, I think are going to be distributed, uh, or just a piece of paper that you've got, so that uh, we can take a look and uh, put them in some kind of clustering. So, if you have any questions, uh, put uh, the speaker that your question is for. Uh, your name, if you would, and what the question is, and we'll uh, do as many as we can uh, with the time that we've got. Our next speaker is uh, Jesse Cardinal, who is the coordinator of, for Keepers of the Athabasca, which works on land, air, and water issues within the Athabasca watershed. Keepers is also the host organization of the yearly Healing Walk, which will take place uh, towards the end of June or early July. It brings together people with impacted communities from Tar Sands Project. So, thank you for being here, Jesse. We look forward to hearing your contribution to the ongoing story. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um... So I just want to start out by thanking, thanking people. I want to thank the um, the, chil the children that are here, the small baby who's hearing all of our words, um, all the elders. I'm not here as a smarter person. I'm just here to tell you guys about some dates and stuff. So I want to thank all the elders that are in the room who carry a lot of knowledge. And as, uh, what did Clayton Thomas Mueller, uh, he said the, gray foxes too. Um, <laughs> I want to thank Mike Byerly for uh, making sure that this teaching happened. I know I was looking forward to seeing David Suzuki too, so I was disappointed about that, but he uh, is total grassroots organizer and he wanted to make sure that the people, um, you know, we still honored the people and that's what we all do. We're here for, you know, the people and, and it's not that Ariel isn't, but they're like swamped. So thanks Mike for, you know, busting your butt and making it happen. And, um, and just all the I don't know more Calgary organizers that I see here, Chantel, I see Yvonne, Autumn, um, and Chelsea uh, is the Edmonton organizer, and she's always in the background. She doesn't really do much public speaking, but she's, uh, they started a new organization, Mother Earth Action Co-op, and Chelsea does a lot of the silk screening, so when you see shirts and they have writing on them, she, she does all, a lot of artwork. So. And just the rest of you for showing up and still, still coming, to, coming out to hear us talk. And... Uh, so Mike asked me to talk about the uh, healing walk, but I wanted to crack a joke first because I have a bit of extra time because Mike, he's like, Jesse, you look like a city girl because I live out in the country in Kikino and the bush in northern Alberta and I don't always dress this way, but I was thinking, well, I have these city clothes and I don't get to the city often <laughs> and I haven't been to court in a while, so I'm going to wear them. <laughs> But um, 
The healing walk is something that uh, I work for Keepers of the Athabasca, and uh, we're uh, a group comprised of people all along the Athabasca watershed, so starting from Hinton, Jasper, all the way up, uh, you know, through uh, Athabasca, through Fort Mackay, through Fort Chip, and then it drains into Lake Athabasca and goes into the Northwest Territories. So we work on protection of water, but we also work in other watersheds. Like anything that comes up that's an issue for water, we're working on. And uh, so I work as a coordinator with Keepers of the Athabasca. And when I started, one of the things, the duties that was handed to me was um, to help organize the Healing Walk, which some of you may have heard of. So the Healing Walk happens once a year. Uh, we're going into the fifth fifth annual Tar Sands Healing Walk. And um, that happens right up in Fort McMurray. And we do the walk, like when you do the walk, you actually walk by tailings ponds, you walk by uh, what they call, I think they call them reclaimed tailings ponds. It's basically like you're walking by a desert so it's what used to be the Boreal Forest is now a desert, and you walk by plants. And um, what we're doing is we're praying, right? It's a healing, it's a healing walk. So we bring in ceremonial people. And um, the one thing is we all have the ability to be connected to the land, but not all of us are, you know? But we all do have that ability. And... Uh, all of you, you know, people from different walks of life, you have your different connections to the land, whether it be the water, gardening, whatever. And um, when we see that impacted, like when we see that destroyed, it, it affects us, right? Like it, it hurts us, um, brings us sadness. And Ariel, as one of the founders of the Healing Walk, you know, they've been doing rallies and marches and protests and... She was getting tired of doing that. Like, um, you know, you get tired sometimes. And they, they said, we need to do something different. Like, we need to do something different. And out of that was born the Healing Walk. And uh, so it isn't a protest. It isn't a march. It isn't a rally. It is a, it is a Healing Walk. And when I first went to that, like, um, I was organizing. And, you know, that's what I'm good at, coordinating and stuff. And... And of course, you know, I have my own connection to the land and stuff. And I didn't really expect, like, uh, what one thing we have to do is prepare people. Like, prepare to experience different emotions, because that's part of the healing process. And I wasn't really prepared. And when I went there, um, just before we were, we were going to start the walk, uh, I had, like, this emotional breakdown. Like, I didn't expect all of these emotions to come up. And what set that off was we we're all these people and there's drumming and, uh, you know, kids and everything. And then this big trucker comes by and I expect like the, the negative, you know, like get a job, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And this guy honked, but it was like a supportive like, dude, dude, you know, and it just like psh, all these emotions. Like I just didn't expect that. And um, it is, it's like a form of healing and you know, you know, healing, it's a lifelong journey. So we have people coming back year after year, uh, coming back to the healing walk. And it's, um, so what we've been doing, the healing walk is usually on a Saturday. So on the Friday we do, uh, you know, workshops, like we had um, some elders come and talk about uh, cultural teachings. We had people talk on solar energy. So Friday is like, because what they were doing before was just showing up Saturday and walking and nobody knew anybody. So now we put in Friday, so it's a two-day event. And uh, you come Friday and uh, we all get to know each other. And then Friday, we, uh, Saturday, we do the walk. And it's, it's, uh, it's really nice. And speaking about healing, I, I just... So the date, we don't have the date set yet. It's either going to be the end of the last weekend in June or the first weekend in July. We have a website. It's uh, www.tarsanshealingwalk.org. Uh, www and so uh, if you check that in a couple of weeks, we'll have the date. 
And camping, we provide camping for free because it is costly up there. Like Git says, costs are high, you know, to travel from wherever you guys are coming from. So what we try to do to help you is um, we work with the uh, First Nation communities that are up there and they usually open up land for us to provide camping for free. And uh, we've been providing, uh, you know, a feast and we provide the snacks on the walk and um, so I would say if you haven't been on the walk to, um, to, try, to, to give that an experience. And one thing I just want to mention, like part of healing, um, I want to thank uh, the elder, Gus uh, Many Bears, because I heard you talk in July uh, about residential schools. I was at home in the, in the bush on the, and I got to see it on live screen and uh, it was at a time I really needed it. Like my grandfather had passed away, I think that day. And uh, just to hear you talk, like it provided me comfort. And I'm just really happy to see you here. And I wanted to thank you because you were joking around and you told me that you like humor and stuff like that. And just to see the strength of the elders, like um, it's, uh, it gives us younger people, like for what, um, you know, like, uh, the elders like have experienced and they're, they're still strong like you guys still speak your language and you still tell all of us to be strong and uh it's because of you guys that give us our strength so i want to thank you for that and uh so that's basically it like the healing walk is it's something special and uh uh, just come and check it out. It's in Fort McMurray. And I just wanted to tell you guys, like, I'll try and end on a, on a funny note. I'm trying to be, like, all, you know, whatever. But anyway, Gitz, he's like, uh, he's like, let's have a meeting before the, before the gathering. We need to talk about our strengths. And I'm like, well, you know, like, what do you, what do you mean, like, your strengths? I'm like, well, I have strong calves, you know? Like, am I supposed to show that? Like... He did, and he gets like he's kind of like, you know, he didn't know how to respond or whatever. But I just wanted to thank you guys for your time. And uh, just uh, it's www.tarsanshealingwalk.org. And Keepers of the Water is www.keepersofthewater.ca. Thanks. Well, I hope to see you on the walk this year, Jesse. Our last uh, person on this part of the program is Shannon Houle, who is a newly elected counselor on the Saddle Lake Cree Nation and an Idle No More organizer who has been involved in countless, she says, teach-ins, rallies, and demonstrations and other things of all types. She is a driving force in developing the INM web platforms. Her focus is on the protection of treaties for all future generations. So, Shannon. Well, thank you. Um, a lot of times when I go to these rallies that we have, um, the first thing I do is, as I do a prayer, because to myself, because um, <clears throat> I I can't come up here without acknowledging my ancestors. Um, as much as I try and speak, uh, I have to do it from my heart. So this is where this is coming from, because. My mother said, you can never go wrong. I have a little, I wrote a little bit here because this is such a high profile event and it's unfortunate that we had to bring in a musician or a celebrity to bring awareness. Our voice should be just as strong. And until our people voice is heard equally, then we know this world is changing. 
I just first wanted to also say, to all, for the honor of having it, for being able to come up here and speak as a daughter, a mother, and a grandmother. Yes, I'm a grandmother. <laughs> and a very proud grandmother. All I have is my story and what I've been told by others and my ancestors. I'm a direct descendant of Chief Pakan, one of the Treaty 6 signers. I also, my husband is also a descendant of Chief Big Bear, who's also another signer, and also who was imprisoned for his beliefs of unity. He died for them. I'm a Cree and Dene woman. I'm a teacher by trade. And like he said, I was elected into my nation this year. But I also like to honor my mother's nation, which is Cold Lake First Nations. Treaty is a nation to nation agreement and not a new concept for all indigenous people of these lands. So we know treaty. Before the newcomers, our treaties were not written. They didn't need to be because we ensured that they were protected and honored in every way, one generation to the next. When treaty was made, a person or a family was assigned as treaty keepers. They remembered the agreement word for word. They taught it to their children word for word. And as each generation was born, they were taught word for word. It never changed. It was critical that it was kept in its in original entirety until it was natural to the person for safekeeping in their hearts. So you see, we knew treaties. We knew how to honor them from one generation to the next. It was law to keep your agreements. Your honor was at stake. A nation's honor was at stake. Because these treaties weren't made only with man. They were made in the presence of the creator. And I followed them, and we followed them according to the laws of nature. Our mother, we call earth. Now when you look at the constitution, if you look at that, which was mentioned, we had a conversation today with, I did with another teacher. The Constitution even says that it was made in the eyes of God, in presence of that. You see, I don't live by the law of man. I live by the laws of the land. And this includes the four laws, land, air, water, and sun. It's the acronym for laws. It's that simple. The four elements, you need them to live. All life has to live. If we don't have one of those elements, we do not exist. Life does not exist. They didn't make it up, nobody did. And nature always reminds us we only need to listen. Not hear, but listen. In Canada, the boreal forest is 100% within the Fort McMurray tar sands and Cold Lake oil sands. People don't know this, that there's two huge pools that encompass Alberta and why it's the hub of this country. This boreal forest is one third of the largest producer of oxygen, aside from Amazon and the plankton in the ocean. Of all the water in the world, like Crystal had mentioned, industry is using more of that water than we are. Also what's scary is that all the wetlands, we have destroyed 70% of it in Canada. We have, to, it has to filter our water, it prevents us from droughts, and if we don't do that, Water is precious. We need it. We're all made up of water. 
It's not a choice. We can't just walk away from it. In the boreal forest is also crucial as medicines that heal crucial diseases. In Cold Lake, there was an area where I collected medicine because that's what I do. I'm a medicine gatherer. And at the time that I collected a medicine a few years ago, I was doing it to save my uncle who was dying of cancer. Today, that area is destroyed. I need to mention that my mother also is living with cancer. So her life is um, at stake here. We even have a doctor on my reserve who has told us that our children are being more with are being born more with respiratory problems, allergies, and all that. It's increasing. I myself have also acquired some allergies, and I'm also allergic to certain types of plastics, which oil is made of. It's put me in the hospital a number of times already. Our elders tell us it's our mother being poisoned and disrespected. Now, if you have to make a choice between protecting the water for your children or the oil so you can get those things, what would you choose? We need it. Our water isn't even protected anymore, like was mentioned in Bill C-45 and 38. Your mother, my mother, is raped over and over again. She's violated to the point she's becoming unrecognizable. I'm not saying this for me. I'm saying this and standing up here, putting myself on the line for my son, my 18th month old granddaughter, and all future generations. Because we are only borrowing all of this from them. I can't see. <laughs> I do not want my grandchild to suffer for my ignorance, arrogance, and selfishness. I don't want to have, I do not have the right. This is her future, not mine. As for the land, we don't own it or have a right to disrespect her. She is our mother. She deserves our respect and honor. We all come from her. There is, this is where treaty is key. They also tie us to the land. It's all about understanding that connection to it all. Interdependence, interconnectedness. You can't separate it. It's like the four elements, you can't separate them. This is the true spirit and intent of treaty. The, treaty, the treaties protect our mother. This is how powerful they are. Treaty 6 is the fourth strongest treaty internationally, and all the treaties are recognized internationally. The treaties also reinforce our rights before newcomers to our lands. They reinforced our rights to maintain our way of life, culture, laws, and so forth. They were not to replace our ways our laws and teachings we followed for thousands and thousands of years. This includes education. It was not to be replaced. We were to incorporate your education into ours. A healthy environment is required for all of us to exercise these rights. And if damaged, then our rights have been infringed on and all of us are in danger of harm. Like I said, our laws, it's the four elements. As a sovereign nation who made an agreement with another nation, treaty trumps Canadian law.
Canadian law was borrowed from England to the successor state of Canada. Canada is a state. It has no land and doesn't have its own laws. The United Nation asked Canada over two years ago for their deed to the land. They, had, they were given six months and they still to this date haven't been able to present that. We never surrendered land when our people never had the concept to do so. We understood sharing. We showed this time and time again when we taught the newcomers how to survive on our lands. So what gives Harper the right to sell what isn't his to China or, so, or other places? Look at the state of China. You can't even breathe the air there. When I go on the land, it hurts to see all the destruction. CNRL has a nine month oil spill that they have no clue how to stop in Coal Lake area, the tar sands. Even to go there, you see pipelines and that's another place to go, is go to Esso, drive in there. You're free to go in there. You'll see it looks like a big snake, all these pipelines, and your mouth hurts, your throat hurts. On my 44th birthday in October, I walked over 80 kilometers in three days of a 106 kilometer walk in awareness protest for, with family and friends, mostly children, to bring these issues forward. Because we needed to bring, have all of you, to bring what I say and place it in your hearts so you can take back all our responsibility to the protect our mother. She is dying. She is in such pain and when she suffers, we suffer. Your scientists are, are now saying that the oceans are dying. The root cause is high acidic levels of the ocean because of two things, industry of oil and forestry. They estimate that we are on a one-way ticket to extinction. Now this is information that's come from Dr. Suzuki, Dr. Schindler. There's doctors all over. They're scientists, your scientists are saying this. We don't have tomorrow, we only have today. But when our elders tell us what your scientists are now telling you, we've known for thousands of years. We never needed your scientists to tell us what and how to respect our mother, your mother. Our mother has spoken. She is the law. When our mother speaks, that's it. She is telling us enough is enough. So honor the treaties. Honor our mother. Honor our children. Honor the balance. Because our children it's them we borrow all of this from. And it's all about honor. Ay, ay. I would really like us to thank and acknowledge the statements that each person on the panel here has made. And let's give them a round of applause for all of them and what they have told us this day. Don't go anywhere. Thank you. Now, Mike, uh, it's about almost uh, 10 to 6. Do we have any? Where's Mike? 
Oh, there you are. Do we have any time for questions? Because I, I know there's a, a limit to how long we can be here anyway. Okay. Eh? So we need some questions. Hello. Just start calling people out. Where are you going? <laughs> I didn't say I claimed to know anything. <laughs> okay, the first question, because uh, it's all very well for Mike to say we're going to occupy the library, and we might decide to do that, but. I know that some people do have to have to leave for other things, and there's a round dance and a rally outside, so they're, we're going from here to other things too. The first question is for anyone who cares to answer this. Uh, do you think we need a new federal political party for indigenous people and their non-indigenous allies who stand for this land, freedom, and human rights? Um, well, I think that's, that's, that's the question, and this person really wants all of this for hope and change. Do we need this? Uh, Brian Seaman. So who wishes to take that on? Do we need a new political party? Yes, uh, since I'm a newly elected leader, <laughs> it might be, uh, might be the one that might be directed at. Um, the thing is that's tricky question for us because um, you see the treaties existed before Alberta and a lot of the provinces and because our treaties were based on nation to nation agreements it's kind of hard for us to um, participate in a political system that is not ours because it's, yeah, it's created to work against us. It is not our way of, of uh, it's not our laws. We, we had well-functioning uh, political systems within ourselves already. You look at um, the Six Nations, you know, we, we had ways of, um, of diplomacy. And um, what we need, we need to create and um, be allowed, not allowed, um, respected for our opportunity to bring those forward according to our treaties also. Because even our political systems, like me being elected, that's not ours. We had our own ways. We had the seven fires, we had different things that honored all our people and gave a voice to all. So there's a different system that we have, but we were, we were kind of forced another system on us. So it's a tricky little situation. Like I know people want us to, like, uh, to vote. I've heard that before. I've seen some of the posts on that. And, you, and when you understand where we're coming from, that's all we're asking. Just understand where we're coming from. When you're a nation, why would we participate? When we're a nation at the same level as the queen, why would we participate in a state? I think. One more uh, response is, uh, from the panel, and then there's a couple more questions before we have time. Yeah, just to further to it, there is a, there is a, there is a treaty alliance that's being formed within our uh, treaty gatherings also. So you can look that up, uh, Derek Niepenuk.
I think uh, in the beginning, the British landed and they said, work with us and things will turn out great. And then they tried to kill all of us. And then the French came and they were like, oh, well, hold on, work with us. We'll treat you a lot better than the French did or the British did. And then they tried to kill all of us. And then Canada was founded and then there was political parties that were popping up and then each political party said, we will have your best interests for us. And I don't know, I don't, I'm just sitting here in front of you, none of their policies ever worked in favor of us. So to have another party <laughs> makes no sense to me. That's my reply. <laughs> okay, the next uh, question is uh, obviously, not obviously, but to any panel member who wishes to respond to it. You point out the failings of the federal government but isn't the real issue here a confrontation between two worldviews, sustainability versus capitalism? I think, like, oh God, this, I, this is the question I always like, think about. Um, we invade Iraq, or the states invades Iraq, and they have this thing where you either with, uh, the, you're with the invasion or you're against the soldiers, and that's the way they spun it. And there was no uh, ability to be critical of like, what's going to happen, what's our Isaac strategy, what we actually plan to do there. It's similar to the expansion and the development of tar sands. You are either for it 100%, and you cannot be critical of it at all whatsoever. The minute you are critical of it, it's because you're like some weird pinko, you don't like Canada, you hate the development. And all we're asking for is accountability. We're, we're like looking down the road to see where is this taking us? And can we improve this? I mean, as people, it's just voicing your, your concerns. I, if we never voiced your concerns, where would we be right now? And where would equality be for, for women in, in the job place? Still has a lot of work to go, but it's a lot better than it was like 40, 50 years ago. I mean, people of color can now use the same bathrooms as white people, and that's because we got critical of it. This is the exact same thing. We're looking to be critical. It's not two opposing worldviews, and that's, that, that's the sickness right now, is the fact that you're either with development or you're totally against it. That, you just have to get that mind frame completely out of here. There's, we have to bridge the gap together. Okay, again, this is, this is to everybody, but one or two people can answer or whoever wants to. Does the ACFN see an opportunity in the upcoming federal by-elections in Athabasca and McLeod to advance this issue? And Larry Ashmore, the Green Party of Canada. Yes. Yes. Hey. <laughs> I, I just, I don't have, I don't really have a lot of faith in the political system as it is. Yeah, we do, we, yeah, we can switch things, but it's really, we're voting for the lesser evils. To, to me, that's what it is. It's the lesser evils for these political parties. Because you don't hear any of these political parties right now talking about uh, the perilous situation that our indigenous women are in right now. If you think about it, like none of them have actually come out and said, we need to stop this. This trend of murdered and missing women is, is no longer acceptable here in this country. You hear none of them saying that. There are more laws and protection protecting our dogs more than our women. It, the, the worst and most perilous person you can be in Canada is an Aboriginal or an Indigenous woman right now. So until these uh, political parties come out and say, we are going to stop this and curb this trend, why vote? Okay, now... Just because of the, uh, Crystal, you haven't said a word. Stop to them, I oh, I, oh, that's very good. Oh, you're giving them their lines. Oh, that's very good. Okay. Now, this is a, this is a very interesting uh, question, I, I think. It, it shifts it a little bit. What do you do if your leadership in a First Nation is going with industry and not treaty? If the, if the legal fights do not result in a favorable outcome, what are the next steps? But let's do the first one first and then that one. I'm kind of hoping this isn't on. Um, <laughs> is the live stream still on? <laughs> um, unfortunately, I can't really, if the live stream's on, I can't really go into depth in that question. Um, just because of the position that we're kind of in right now. Um, I'm just, I'm joining the comms team right away. Looks like yeah. Jesse will though. Yeah. Um, so I'm from a, <clears throat> uh, Métis community, Métis settlement in Northern Alberta. And, uh, uh, what we're doing is we're starting grassroots organizing. So that's why the, pe the, the power of the people and the voice of the people, it really is strong. 
Um, so you work with those people, like you give the people a voice because often those leaderships that work in industry, um, they take on the voice of everybody and that's not always the voice of everybody. So you need an opposition in everything, right? Or not, and I don't even see it as an opposition, but you need people that show the other side of the story. So like for instance, we have a lake and our council is not doing anything to protect that lake. They're, they're trying to exploit it, like make a resort. Come one, come all, come everybody, you know? Any boats, any this, any that. And uh, so we started, the people uh, started a water council. And it's just a grassroots community water council. Um, and it, it's an empowerment thing, you know? So that's what I would say is like, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm not there to spend all my energy criticizing these leaders because uh, I know at one time when uh, the Industrial Revolution was happening in Canada, the Native people were so poor, you know, like my mom comes from a family of nine, so to be offered a job to go and work, you know, and have a car and have all these things that the, the white people already had, like, you know, I don't judge my mom for doing that because she was doing what was given to her at the time. And it got out of control. Like, you you baby boomers, like, you just, you guys got out of control, you know? <laughs> so now we're trying to get a handle on it. It's like, you know, like, we got to uh, quit living above our means, you know, become conscious energy users, um, work with the indigenous people who are in touch with the treaties that go back to the protection of the water, the land, the air, those kinds of things. So uh, we got to kind of balance out now and get in check with stuff. I just want to say that this is the best way that I could say it, is that the issue for me, and, and I can understand where my leadership is coming from and where so many other leaders come from, is that the position that we're in right now as First Nations people, as Indigenous peoples of this, of this land, is that it should never be okay that you have to choose your indigenous ways of knowing and being who you are as an indigenous person, your morals and your values over feeding your family. Because unfortunately today, my kids got to eat. So that's why I understand where my leadership sits, but it should never be okay. It should never come down to that, ever. Okay. Uh, um Gets, okay, each of you can have a comment and then we'll wrap up this part of it. A lot, a lot of the, ooh, there's been a lot of people up north, that's, chiefs, I'm not going to say which ones, they know who they are, um, that have really, uh, have really suckled from the pig um, over, the, the, over their, their people and the future. Um, and that's the older mentality. And I'm th thank God that a lot of them are, are old now. Um, you know? <laughs> I, I do. I really I, that that old mentality is phasing its way out, and you have we're having now uh, young, indigenous, fearless people that really don't uh, that, that see the old mentality, that see these problems that go with it. I, I'm glad that they're they're getting old. I'm glad that uh, they're out of office, or they're going to be out of office, and their lies are being exposed after all these years. And I'm glad that old mentality is dying. Shannon, and then we'll close this part. I am. Um, it's a, it's an interesting question because I you know when I got into um, council, I was told I had to choose between the work that I do for Idle No More and just Mother Earth to politics. And I said, Why do I have to choose? I'm here for the people. That's simple. The people are the one who um, encouraged me to do this. I'm okay where I'm at. It wasn't something that I wanted to go to for power or nothing. My goal is I had an agenda which was to make some change. That's all. There were a lot of powerful, good leaders in my nation. And I can only speak for my nation. They made a lot of good decisions. But there were some that were the result of that forced system, like Indian Residential School, 
making us think that we're individuals and not collective people. And yeah, they made mistakes, but I do see some of them, former leaders, that sit with us now, telling us, learn from my mistake. I'm here for you. I sit in meetings now because we are trying to bring our language to make it our first language of Cree. And now some of our former leaders are sitting in those meetings with us, working, volunteering. So I, I'm on a, you know, I always have to honor. And we make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. I will probably make mistakes. I know I will. But the thing about standing by what you believe in here is about being able to make those hard decisions and standing with them. I have told my fellow council members, I will stand there, I will be arrested, I will go the line for my people. Not because I'm on a power trip, because it's life or death for us. Why? Should we be have to justify this all the time? We are a people that have nothing, but had everything. But the key thing we have still is our spirit. Now that's about treaty. That's the key to finding out and understanding treaty. It's the spirit. We all will still have that after we're gone from this land. So I don't want to stick on politics because that's not what this is about. This is about every one of us honoring the treaties and agreement. It's higher than a politics. Hi, hi. I'm going to close th this part with a, uh, this isn't a question, it's a thank you to you. Thank you to all the speakers and organizers for your time, your wisdom, and bringing vital messages to us in Calgary. Making these connections between treaties, the earth, future generations, federal and corporate violations, healing and emotions is so, so important. And then this is, I want you to really hear this. I would rather listen to you than Suzuki or Neil Young. <laughs> and I will bring your words to share with many others. Thank you with much love. So, oh, excuse no. me, wait one, one, one moment. Uh, Mike, you want to get up? One sec. All right, so we had the idea a little while ago to do something when the young came to town and my chief came here. And I was like, hey, Mike, let's, let's put together a, a, a teaching. He's like, yeah, cool. And then I gave him all the work to do. <laughs> so this was uh, all of us being here. I just had called some people. You know, We had some people bail out. These, these amazing, powerful, indigenous, and beautiful women came down to, to help us out when the other ones uh, didn't show up. You know, This is all like Mike, though. So everybody give him a big round of applause because this is him. <laughs> 